Right, so we've come inside, thank goodness, and we have North American's folly and a very different approach to just about everything. So let's talk F-107. Yeah, so I'll be honest, I know less about this airplane than the others, probably because it never went into yeah. service. For good um, reason, look at it. Yes, yeah. and it be, so there's not as much information on it, and there's not one at my local air museum back home, so I'm not used to talking about this airplane. Um, I think the way you explained this was this was North American's attempt to make a much higher performance airplane without completely starting over. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of common elements here to the F-100 Super Sabre. I don't know how many actual common parts there are. It might be one of those cases where there's like none. But if you look at the fuselage shape, um, the wing, the tail, both tails, like there's a lot of family resemblance here to the F-100. And so I think the big problems they were trying to solve here, one is how to get a bigger engine into it. Secondly, radars were a thing at this point, and I don't remember exactly what year this was, but probably mid to late 50s. Radar was very much a thing. You had to get a radar into an airplane. So this pedo inlet on the nose doesn't work anymore, nor does a pedo inlet work for the kind of speeds they're trying to get here. I believe, if I remember right, this was trying to get up to like the Mach 2 range to compete with the F-104 and so forth. So if you're gonna to try to stick with the same airframe, you gotta put the inlets somewhere. And for whatever reason, they decided to stick them on top of the fuselage, <laughs> which theoretically works just fine. Um, this I, inlet's kind of interesting. It's, it's a, a style of inlet that's much like what we get eventually on the uh, F-15 or the, even the, the F-4 or the F-106 we just saw, but it's two stuck together. Um, and so basically that's a way to get uh, the, the ramp system, which you can kind of see in there, that hinge line, get that in there for variability at various Mach speeds, but get it in a, thing, in a, in a location where that inlet's not stuck on the side of the fuselage. Uh, why they chose to do that and not just stick it on the side of the fuselage, I don't know that answer. <laughs> and I suspect this would have been a more successful airplane if they had just done that. So I, I suspect, again, it was back to the, let's save as much as we can from the fuselage. And if you start to put a, a different inlet duct through the side walls, you're very much changing the structure of that fuselage. So I don't know. I, I don't have a better answer for you. But um, what is interesting about the inlet is that is the configuration that ended up being on um, the, the uh, Valkyrie. So uh, the Valkyrie inlet looks very much like that. It's underneath the wing instead of on top of the fuselage, but it looks darn near identical to that. So the two big problems with this, one is um, air tends to accelerate faster over the top of airplanes, the kind of the way the way wings work and fuselage shapes and so forth. And so inlets below the airplane where the, air, the full is naturally being slowed down is just a better place to put them on, on top. That probably is not that big of a penalty, but it certainly doesn't help. Then the obvious problem here is ejection, is getting out of the airplane past that inlet that's literally right behind your head. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the exact history. I don't think any of these ever crashed, I don't think, because I think there's only two of them built, I think, maybe three. There's one in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, there's one here, and I think that might be the only two that were ever built. Um, and looking at the wing, it's, there's nothing too I, drastic I to it than think that we've already discussed. Very similar, if not identical, to an F-100 wing. The Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona is home to one of the largest non-government funded aviation and space museums in the world. Featuring nearly 400 aircraft, the museum is home to an incredible collection like NASA's NB-52 X-15 dropship and 747 SP Sophia Airborne Observatory to a wealth of rare military types from air forces all around the world to the first production 777. Whether you are a military or civilian aviation geek, there will be an incredible aircraft around every corner of this epic 80 acre site for you to explore. As the Aviation Show's partnership with the Pima Air and Space Museum enters its third year, we're delighted to say that Pima is truly a top of your bucket list museum to visit. And it keeps getting better, as this year the Tucson Military Vehicle Museum will be opening right next door. To find out more about the incredible collection and the fantastic events coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum, and of course the Tucson Military Vehicle Museum, head over to www.pimaair.org to plan your trip to one of the world's great aviation collections, and one that now includes tanks next door, if that's your sort of thing. So. We're going to jump on to the thing behind you in a second, but what was the legacy of the Century Series? Because the Century Series is kind of something that historians have made up and, and, and stuff. 
it wasn't advertised as such. No, right. I don't know when that name was actually coined, but probably after the yeah. fact. Yeah, so the, so the legacy of this is, is, is not surprising, but it's also kind of disappointing. So it was this like, what I call the old west <laughs> for almost a decade where there was like blank checks to be written. There was a lot of development, a lot of development did happen. Like there was so much that was learned on each of these airplanes. And again, they were good enough to put them in service. Most of them only stayed in service for a couple years. Um, the, you know, the, the exceptions are the F-104, I think are still flying somewhere in the world, I think. Maybe not. Probably. Uh, anyway, but, but most of them only lasted for a few years. The F-100 did last through Vietnam, so it had a life of, what was that, 10 or 15 years, but as a- It was in guards regiments for a long yeah, time. Yeah, as a different type of an airplane, yeah. not as a frontline fighter. So uh, anyway, there was a lot of learning, like inlets, materials, control systems, aerodynamics, all of that just like went massive strides. And not just the Century Series, of course. The Navy was doing their own thing, Great Britain, France, Russia, like every country was doing the same thing at the same time and learning from one another and so forth. In the US, the Department of Defense, at the time run by Nat McNamara, was kind of getting tired of writing blank checks. <laughs> so he came at the end of this decade and said, okay, aerospace companies, in the next decade, in 1960s, I want one airplane. So not one a year, not one per service, I want one airplane. So you all work together, you give us, you know, give me some, some competitors. By the way, Navy and Air Force, I said one airplane, you all have got to share it. <laughs> so you all work together and figure out the requirements. And that's essentially what came out as the F-111, which has, has, people have mixed opinions of, most of them not so positive, <laughs> because to me it was a compromise design. It was too much trying to do what the Air Force wanted and the Navy wanted, and if they're like, okay, if we only get one airplane this decade, we've got to put everything in it we ever wanted. You know, every performance feature, a brand new engine, every avionics upgrade, et cetera. And it just came and turned into what we now think of as bloated military programs that take 10 or 20 years. And then at the end, you still get an airplane with whatever performance. So unfortunately in the 60s, everything we just talked about stopped <laughs> and you got one airplane. And then actually you got two. Eventually the Navy separated, convinced whoever that this really didn't work for them so you get the F-14. But then you got to really fast forward into the 70s before you get to the F-15 and the F-16. So yeah, vast, vastly different change in development procedure. And I think the industry got less innovative because of that. Be sure to check out the full-length Century Series video filmed at the Pima Air and Space Museum and the two follow-up videos on the F-101 Voodoo and F-110 Spectre, better known as the F-4 Phantom II.